We're going to read uh, Mary's song uh, now. We're going to read it together. And um, is it possible for it? Thank you. That's wonderful. It comes up on my screen as well. So we read together from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 56. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has looked with favour on the lowly state of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. Indeed, his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has come to the aid of his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. Let's pray. <clears throat> Even as the angel greeted Mary with the word of God, so we've heard it sung and read this morning, may the Holy Spirit grant us understanding of it and obedience to do what it asks of us. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. So today in our Advent series, we come to the third one. Uh, the Advent Manifesto is our book that we're uh, reading during Advent. I'm so pleased we're doing reading and using that book. Uh, I was at a BRF Ministries board meeting this week, and I've heard that uh, I think about 20,000 copies have been sold. So you're one of many people reading the Advent Manifesto this Advent. And this is the first of a number of songs in Luke's account of the birth of Jesus. And at the heart of this story is Mary's song, a poem or a hymn with a deeply Advent theme, looking back to God's faithfulness in the past, and forward to what is to come, and uh, placing it very squarely in the present moment. Second slide, please. From the age of eight, I was a choir boy at All Saints Church in Patcham. You can imagine the picture, little white ruff, black cassock, Actually, they were blue cassocks and, and a long surplus. I must have looked the part, even if at the beginning I didn't quite sound the part. But uh, from the age of eight until I was 18 and moved away from Patcham to go to university, I sang in morning service and evening service every Sunday, 11 o'clock morning prayer, 6.30 evening prayer. Five hymns to sing in each, chanting the Psalms, singing the canticles, which in the every, nearly every Sunday evening was the Magnificat, the song we've just read together. It was named Magnificat after the first word of it in the Latin version. On special feast days, we would sing a special version of the Magnificat, one of the few choral versions this small parish church choir had in its repertoire. And ever since, I must confess, I've had a passion for the mag and nunc, as they're called in the trade, Magnificat and Nunc Dimittis. The Nunc Dimittis is one of the uh, texts we'll be reading, I think, on New Year's Eve uh, in our sermons uh, in Advent. Uh, the song that Simeon sang when Mary brought Jesus to the temple with Joseph for him to be blessed. 
I must have sung the Magnificat most Sundays for about 10 years. That amounts to about 450 times or so, I guess. And now I read it quite often on a Monday morning in the Order for Baptist Ministry daily office. Uh, you could say that this is in my bloodstream, it's certainly in my memory, especially in the prayer book version. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations will call me blessed, and so forth. The danger with such familiarity, as is the danger with the whole of the Christmas story, is that we lose the radical nature of what Mary is actually saying. The Gospel message and the Advent message which encompasses it looks at the coming rule, the coming kingdom rule of Christ, the Lamb upon the throne in the midst of the New Jerusalem, the image that closes our Bible at the end of the book of Revelation. And it also reminds us of the long history of the story of the prophets uh, announcing that this Savior would come. And this message is one of the world's values and priorities being turned upside down and all set against the commitment of God to his people. Next slide, please. So this morning we're going to think about uh, a faithful promise, some faulty priorities and some future principles. At its outset, this is a hymn of praise to God. To magnify is to make something bigger, a magnifying lens. It's to make something great, to extol or to praise. And Mary understands that God is both merciful saviour and coming judge. He has saved his people out of uh, Egypt and the whole story of the Old Testament is one of God's continuous process of saving his people, not only from those around who would want to destroy them, but from uh, themselves, really. He is saviour. But the one that Mary bore would not just be the saviour of Israel. He would be the saviour of the whole world, of the whole of humanity throughout the whole of time. But at the moment, Mary needs some more urgent salvation. She would soon deliver this baby that she's carrying. There would be no obstetrician, obstetri uh, that's always a difficult word to say. There would be no um, obstetrician on call, uh, no pain relief. Uh, and amidst all of the risks that birth presented both then and still in some parts of the world today. One of the most dangerous things women in some parts of the world will ever do is to become pregnant. Such is the continuing high rates of mortality in childbirth. But Mary, who had said yes to God's invitation to bear his eternal son, some months earlier, knows that God is first of all saviour. He is merciful towards those who fear him and he will save her through the uh, process of childbirth. Our world is full of fear at the moment. Fear of the climate emergency. Fear of a worldwide conflict developing out of those wars which are taking place in Israel and Gaza and Russia and Ukraine. The residual fear that's been lingering in the atmosphere, as it were, following the COVID lockdown, about which we've been hearing a great deal in the inquiry over the last two or three weeks. Surely, fear is the last thing we need in today's world. But this kind of fear, the fear of God, is not fear which is filled with anxiety and dread, but it's filled with wonder and love and awe. It's the kind of fear that a little child has 
when it discovers something new and it's absolutely amazing. That's the fear of God that Mary sings about. It recognizes God for who he is. He's the God of might and power beyond measure. The one who has strengthened his arm and bared his arm, rolled his sleeves up to do something about the world's pain and difficulty. But he's also the intimate God, the God who is Father, the God who loves, the one who looks with favor upon the lowliness of this teenage girl who describes herself as God's handmaiden or God's servant. This God whom we praise also puts the world to rights in ways that are just beyond measure. He is faithful to his promise. And during Advent, we rehearse the promises of the birth of Christ in the Old Testament because it sheds light on the way that God is faithful to his promise. And that gives us confidence that the God who kept his promise then will keep his promise now and in the future. And that gives us hope. So the first thing about this hymn that... Mary pens or sings or inspired by the Holy Spirit to deliver reminds us of God's faithful promise. But the hymn, secondly, speaks about the world's faulty promises. Any glance at the media will tell you what the world's priorities are. Pride in its achievements. Addiction to its riches. Hunger for power and the longing for fame and much else besides, but those four things in particular struck me. Sports women and men become global superstars and then become clothes horses for the most expensive clothes you can buy. Politicians travel to Australian jungles to gain more of a media profile and restart their political career mentioning no names. Powerful politicians pursue their self-aggrandizing agendas at the expense of the nobodies, be they the nobodies or the ordinaries in Israel or in Gaza, Ukraine or elsewhere. And that's true of any number of countries ruled by petty tyrants. Those who were at danger of death from COVID were dismissed as, quotes, having had a good innings, as if they were now dispensable. They were acceptable collateral damage when the state of the economy was at stake or a libertarian conviction replaced compassion. Nothing was any different in Mary's world. The superpower Rome An empire based upon a slave economy was infamous for its violent suppression of dissent. That's what crucifixion is for. That was its tool. And the court of King Herod, more near to home for Mary, was notably corrupt. But Mary sees another world coming. A world where pride and untrammeled power and riches are named for what they are. Obscenity in the face of the world's needs. And what the world values, God does not. And what the world prioritizes, God reverses. And the coming of Jesus was the next great step in the unfolding of God's purposes in this great reversal of human history. Hallelujah. So what about some future principles from this song that Mary sings? In this coming kingdom, God will look with favor upon the lowly. A peasant girl from a village in the back of nowhere in a world where men held most of the power, and Rome was the center of things, or more locally, Jerusalem, Mary was the one favored by God. Fame will come to Mary, and she knows it. All generations will call me blessed. 
but it's fame because of what God will do, not for what she achieves or manipulates or employs an agent to stroke. In his coming kingdom, God will fill the hungry with good things while the rich will be sent away empty. And agencies like Christian Aid and Tear Fund take this as their purpose, acting to serve the have-nots while shining the light of truth <coughs> upon those who have so much. They do so inspired by Mary's manifesto for the way the world should be. And in this coming kingdom, the proud are scattered. An echo of the pride of the builders of Babel and of every self-sufficient enterprise ever since. God sides with the nobodies of the world, and Jesus lives that out. But apart from immediately putting Rome in its place, <coughs> the coming of Jesus would seem to have perhaps been a failure in what Mary might have imagined, conditioned as she was by the hopes of her culture and day. By the end of Jesus' life, Herod was still on his throne, although a different Herod, but a Herod remained on his throne. Pilate lounges in his chair while the throne provided for the King of Kings is a wooden cross. Yet, yet, yet a mustard seed has been planted yet to reach its full potential in human history, where a society and a community and God's new creation will be where the hungry are fed and the poor are valued. The planet and its climate is cherished and the violent are subdued while the humble are lifted high. And Advent reminds us that we are in this long game. It hasn't happened yet, but brothers and sisters in Christ, Advent tells us one day it will. It will. The book of Revelation is read during Advent precisely to remind us of that fact. And Mary is the epitome of all that she sings about. Here she is, heavily pregnant, already probably the object of knowing looks and harsh glares. So who's the father then? And her not married yet. <laughs> she has no fortune. Her daily life is a, an uncertain scrabble for the necessities. And she's soon to give birth and face all the uncertainty that a first century birth would entail. But God is faithful to her, looks with favor upon her, will fill her with good things and lift her up in his saving and powerful arms because just as God was faithful to her ancestors, so he will be merciful and faithful to her, the teenager who'd put her trust in God when she said yes to Gabriel, the angel visitor. There are plenty of images of, Jesus, of uh, Mary with the angel arriving to greet her, and plenty of images of Mary with a very plump and bonny uh, baby uh, on her lap, presumably, one hopes, not newborn, not that big, anyway. Uh, but um, these are very familiar images from Renaissance art. What we don't get so many images of is this, a picture of a pregnant Mary, one of the greatest among that very minor genre in early Italian Renaissance art is one by Piero della Francesca called the Madonna del Parto. You can see it still, it's in a chapel in Monterci near Arezzo in uh, Tuscany. She's there heavily pregnant with her hand on her hip in a 
pose familiar to many in her state. No doubt her back aches <laughs> and her hips are sore. She looks tired, waiting as every woman does in late pregnancy with a rather subdued demeanor, not sure quite how long it's going to be before she gives birth. Does that sound familiar to any mothers in the, the congregation or online this morning? She's depicted in a kind of tent, and you probably, possibly can see on the tent are some um, embroidery. It's actually embroidery of pomegranates, and pomegranates were a Renaissance image of fertility and also of the passion of Christ. Hers is the womb in which God has taken residence. Or perhaps it's the tent of meeting where God meets with his people and she's the, the tabernacle, the tent, enclosing the presence of God as yet unborn. But in the end, Piero has depicted her as she is, a young woman, pregnant, exhausted, uncertain quite of what will happen to her. And the one who will be born of her, Jesus, will identify with those who are like her. Those exhausted by the demands made upon them by life or by the legalistic religion of Jesus' day. Remember that Jesus' harshest words were reserved for those who laid heavy burdens on others but made no effort to assist in bearing them. Luke eleven forty six. Woe to you, lawyers, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. Or those who are uncertain of their future, or where the next meal might come from, or where they will be housed tonight. Those who are the objects of scorn and abuse from the self-righteous and the hypocritical, these are the ones who Jesus identifies with and draws alongside. That may be you or me today. Mary's song then invites us to choose who we will identify with, who we will aspire to be. Will it be the rich and famous? And even the church has its ecclesiastical equivalence of that. Do we aspire to be powerful, to be amongst the proud? Or will it be with those who are on the margins of our world, those who are on the margins of our local neighborhood, even with those who are on the margins of the church because of their struggles with doubt, or their sexuality, or their past, or whatever it might be, that makes them feel at the margins. So together with our praise of God this morning, our own, my soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit doth rejoice in God my Savior, we can renew our commitments to the hungry and the lowly, the nobodies and those whose only hope is in God and in his faithful compassion. That's when we seek to follow Christ in the people and places the world habitually ignores and rejects. Where we see Christ in the face of an exhausted woman awaiting the delivery of her child while facing the supermarket with a stroppy toddler who's about to have a meltdown in the sweet aisle because it wants the whole lot. Or meeting Christ in the face of the elderly with faces wrinkled by years of work and hands riddled with arthritis. Or maybe meeting Christ in the face of the migrant, fearful of being sent back to the horrors from which they have fled. Or in the face of the child wounded in a bomb attack, now destroyed along with their family, the whole home and future that they had expected. Here, we meet Christ today. And by serving them, by praying for them, by saying these are the people who we identify with, 
by showing mercy precisely there, we follow Jesus, born of Mary, born of the one who sang, my soul magnifies the Lord. <laughs>